Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, I'm working on your financial freedom. And to be honest with you, I think the economy is helping us out. I really think the economy is helping us out. And here's why I think this. I was reading an article by Marcus and Millichap. Now, who is Marcus and Millichap? Well, they're a Lifestyles Unlimited vendor. In other words, they're part of our vendor program that we offer all of our members at Lifestyles Unlimited, and they are in the commercial real estate sector. So one of the things I love about Marcus and Millichap is that they spend a lot of time and effort doing a lot of research. Now, some of the research is useful to me. Yeah, it is. Some of it's not. And and let me just explain why. Because of the investing I do, I only look at the multifamily markets. Now, having said that, I will look at the overall health of the commercial real estate markets. But I don't use the global information that covers all of the commercial markets because when you start to look at all the different types of commercial real estate out there, you start to realize that they're all different. Now, they all have the same fundamentals to a certain extent. I mean, they they all consist of land and most of them consist of improvements on that land. But that's where it ends because in the different sectors of commercial real estate, There are different ways for you to invest your money. What am I getting at? All right. So I like residential income producing real estate. I have learned over time that that is the best way for me to invest my money because I get paid six different ways. I do. I get paid six different ways. Having said that, there are other places you could put your money when it comes to commercial real estate. There's things like retail. There's things like hotel. There's things like industrial. There are even trailer parks. You could even invest in trailer parks. But when the dust all settles, at the end of the day, people need a place to live. People don't always need a place to sell their goods and services. People don't always need a place to make their goods or services. People don't necessarily need hospitality related entities but at the end of the day people need a place to lay their head down at night and with the exception of the homeless population in this country everybody in this country lives somewhere now some people live in properties that they own i'm I'm one of those people i i bought a house specifically to consume i don't look at it as an investment because this house does not pay me five different ways when it comes to the single family space. Now, those of you paying attention, you probably noticed that I talked about six different ways a moment ago when I was talking about commercial real estate. But when I switched gears and I said, single family, it's only five different ways. The difference is this. In multifamily commercial real estate, there's actually a sixth way we make money and has to do with the ability to force appreciation. That's doing things to the asset that increases the value of the asset. And in doing so, when the value of the asset goes up and you're causing that to happen, you're forcing appreciation on that asset. Now you can't do that in single family properties. And and it has to do with the way these two different types of assets are actually valued. Yeah, it's, it's just that simple. So in single family, what you do is you go out and you agree with somebody to pay a certain price for a property. And of course you did your homework. You looked at what comparable sales were for that type of asset in that particular area. And that, that either justified your price point or it made you modify your price point. And in doing so you made an offer. Now the the seller of the property probably has done their homework too. They have a good understanding of what that property is potentially worth 
in the marketplace. When you two come together on an agreed price, you're under contract. But unless you're paying all cash, there's a lender involved, and that lender wants to also validate the value of that property. So they're going to cause you to go out and get an appraisal. So the appraiser is going to go out and they're going to look at what comparable properties in that particular marketplace have sold for, and they're either going to agree or not agree with the price you came up with. When it comes to commercial real estate, it's kind of a different animal. It's a different animal because what's going to happen is instead of looking at what properties have sold for in that particular neighborhood, what you're going to do is you're going to look at what are the potential returns on investment for a particular asset if I were to pay all cash for that asset. And as a result of that, you're going to establish value for the property. Now, in the multifamily space, lenders do want you to get an appraisal just, just to make them confident that the numbers are all working. But that appraisal is also done using something called the income approach. That is the part of the appraisal that has the highest value, not necessarily what similar apartment communities have sold for. More importantly, what the income streams on those properties are. So let's say you're looking at an apartment community and let's say you're going to pay all cash and let's say you're comfortable earning a 5% return on your investment. In other words, the cash on cash return based on you paying full price for that property should give you a 5% return on investment. We call that a capitalization rate. In other words, capitalization rates are set based on what assets have the ability to produce in the marketplace. It's really a neat function, but here's the better thing. Because you can force appreciation up, you don't have to wait for natural appreciation to occur. Now, having said all of that, what we're gonna get into today is we're gonna talk about jobs. Jobs, wait a minute, what's that got to do with this? Stick around, you're gonna find out. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. All right, the last segment I got off on a tangent there, I was talking about how in multifamily properties, we have the ability to force appreciation on the property based on what we do with the property. In other words, What we're looking to do is increase the income streams of the property while controlling the expenses. And that gives us something called net operating income. Net operating income is one piece of the puzzle that you need to determine value on multifamily properties. The other piece is the capitalization rate. Now, I don't set the cap rates. Lifestyles Unlimited doesn't set the cap rates. No, cap rates are set by the general marketplace. In other words, it's based on what any particular entity, and an entity could be you or me, are willing to pay for an asset and what they're willing to get in the form of a cash on cash return if they paid all cash for the property. Now, one of the things that we do is we leverage the property. We, we never go into a commercial real estate deal with all cash. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But I think the most important reason for it is the fact that the lender, even though they may be putting up as much as 80% of the value of the purchase, in other words, you come with 20% down, they come in with 80%, they do not participate in the equity growth. No, they participate based on the fact they're lending you money on a predisclosed interest rate that you're going to hold that loan for a certain period of time. They may or may not put prepayment penalties in, and that's how they make their money. So if you bought a multifamily asset, and let's say you bought it for a million dollars, and over time you're able to increase the value of the property by doing the things that we teach you at Lifestyles Unlimited. Now let's say that property is worth $2 million and you decide to sell it. The lender 
doesn't participate in the fact that you made an extra million dollars on that property. No, that's your money. That's your money. That's one of the neat things about real estate investing. But what I wanted to get into was an article that I read by Marcus and Millichap. And what they were talking about is jobs. Yeah, jobs. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, what, what does jobs have to do with commercial real estate? And it has everything to do with commercial real estate. Because when people are working, they have income. When they have income, they can afford to pay for the goods and services that they consume in their life. One of the things that I do is I provide clean, functional workforce housing for a demographic population that desperately desires it. And in exchange, that demographic group is willing to pay me about one third of their income for their housing expense. Yeah. Housing is probably the the largest expense that most consumers have. Bar none. Bar none. So, jobs. Why are we so worried about jobs? Well, in the bigger picture of commercial real estate, jobs have an influence on commercial real estate. Because the more people that are working, the better commercial real estate is. Let's say you're invested in, oh, I don't know, industrial property. Now, I'm not invested in industrial property, but let's say you are invested in industrial property. Depending on what goods or services are prepared on your industrial property, the job numbers may have an influence on you. In other words, you may be in a segment of the market that is struggling. That is not just struggling to produce goods and services. Maybe it's struggling to maintain jobs because maybe either the job workforce is not interested in the job or you're just not able to attract workers to make your commodity or whatever it is you're producing. So that can have an influence on industrial real estate. It can also have an influence on commercial real estate when it comes to residential. You see, if your resident is not working, how are they going to pay the rent? That's kind of a big deal. One of the things that we do at Lifestyles Unlimited is we teach you how to screen and select the best residents from amongst a a very big pool of potential residents. And one of the things that we target when it comes to the demographic that we're looking to service is we're looking for people that have jobs that are essential jobs. Yeah, essential workers. I mean, you think about it. When we went through the pandemic, the government said you had to stay home. But there was a a group of people that were not mandated to stay home. These people were deemed essential workers. These people were deemed necessary to keep the goods and services that our country relies upon in play. Now, not every job out there is considered an essential job. I mean, look what happened to the service industry. I mean, think about it. service industry. That's, that's all your, your restaurants. Those are your, your hotels. That's, that's Vegas. Vegas is a service industry because it provides entertainment to those that go there. As a matter of fact, when I was scuba diving a little bit uh, earlier in the year, I went down to Cozumel and I was talking with some of the locals down there. And I asked them just how, how difficult was it for them to, to endure the pandemic? And person after person told me it was very difficult because Cozumel is a island that's a part of Mexico that is tourism-based. In other words, you go to Cozumel to have a good time. You go to Cozumel to get a good deal on a vacation, and you go to Cozumel to just enjoy the beauty that Cozumel offers you. But when the world shuts down and you can't go there, what about all the people that have jobs there? Well, they might still have their jobs, but there's not a whole lot going on when it comes to actually doing the physical work 
of that job. And as a result, that entire community down there was affected greatly by the pandemic. And jobs were really non-existent down there. People were just scraping to get by. And now that Cozumel is opening up back up, money is starting to flow back into the economy. So we're talking about jobs today. And I mentioned to you that Marcus and Millichap did a beautiful report. And that's what we're going to get into for the rest of the show. And here's the point that they made right off the bat. They said that in 2021, hiring has been strong all the way through the month of October. That's when this uh, report was published. And they said that 5.8 million jobs had been added so far in the year. And that particular number was a record for 2021. That means the U.S. economy is getting to where it's supposed to be. So when it comes to that and it comes to commercial real estate, where should we be putting our dollars? Well, Marcus Millichap, they gave me some insight. And we come back from the break, I'm going to talk about the five markets that are doing really great and the 43 that are lagging. Stick around. Warning. Listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show will change your life. We will teach you how to create wealth and passive income so you can be financially free. And now, back to your host. Welcome back to the show. So when the pandemic started, the United States of America lost 22.4 million jobs nationwide. Yeah, 22.4 million people became unemployed very quickly because employers said, well, I don't necessarily need you to perform this task because the government won't even allow me to open my doors. And as a result of that, I'm I'm just going to have to let you go. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to do that to you, but I'm in the same boat you're in. Since that time, however, America has been coming back. We have been coming back steadily. As a matter of fact, we have recovered of the 22.4 million jobs that we lost since when the pandemic began, we have recovered 18.2 million of those positions since then. That's an 80% recovery rate. That is excellent. In the bigger scheme of jobs, that means that we're currently only about 2.8, okay, call it 3%, below pre-pandemic levels based on a nationwide average. Yeah, we're doing good. But the recovery isn't the same everywhere. No, the recovery has been different in different parts of the country. Now, there are five metropolitan markets that Marcus and Millichap have identified that they believe have fully recovered. But there's 38 more that are still lagging the national average. Out out of 43 markets that they measure, all 43 were lagging at one point, but now five have broken out. 38 are still trying to get there. And let's, let's just call it the way it is. The metros that are struggling tended to have, well, high density cities that had particularly strict COVID protocols, or as I mentioned earlier, cities that relied heavily on tourism. Yeah. So why don't we just start with last place? I mean, who's bringing up the end of the the line? Well, it's New York City. Yeah, New York City. New York City got hammered. I mean, they got hammered based on what happened during the pandemic. They lost almost 960,000 jobs when the pandemic hit. And even though they've recovered probably about half of those jobs, they're still 10.1% below pre-pandemic levels. Yeah. So New York City, I mean, they were in the news, right? I mean, New York City, you turn on the news and we're, we're, we're watching their governor when he was the governor at that time, right? Cuomo. And, you know, 
we would sit and watch what New York was doing, and some of us agreed with it, and some of us didn't. But at the end of the day, we either lived in New York and were affected by it, or we didn't live in New York and we weren't affected by it. Fast forward 19 months, New York is still tr- struggling in last place to try and recover when it comes to jobs. Want to know who's next? Want to know who's next? Well, I will tell you who's next. It is a town that I am very familiar with. As a matter of fact, I was born and raised in this town. And over time, I grew up in this town. And this town is Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, Las Vegas, Nevada is about 7.5% below pre-pandemic levels. And the reason they're still struggling is because, remember, Las Vegas is a tourism-based economy. It is based on services provided to people that want entertainment. Now, Vegas lost about 280,000 jobs, but they've recovered about 72% of those jobs. A lot of those jobs have come back. Vegas is reopening, but it's still affected. So the question I have, would you invest say in New York City, or in Las Vegas. Based on the fact that these two towns are lagging everybody else, do you think that's a smart place to put your money? Now, there there are people that would say yes, and there are people that would say no. So which are you? Which are you? Would, Would you put your money into New York or Vegas? Well, let me give you a third option. Let me Let me take you to the market that did better than those two. Believe it or not, it's Los Angeles. Yeah, Los Angeles. I mean, they're still about 7.4% below the pre-pandemic job numbers that they had. And, and, and LA got hammered pretty hard. They lost 770,000 jobs. But they've recovered about 56% of those. So, so Los Angeles seems to be doing a little bit better. There is another town that's doing a little bit better than those two, and it's, it's the other Disneyland, also known as Disney World. Yeah, it's Orlando, Florida. Again, an economy that thrives on entertainment, that thrives on tourism. They lost about 255,000 jobs, but they've recovered about 65% of those jobs. They're currently at about 6.7% below pre-pandemic levels. And not to be outdone, we got to go back to the the West Coast again to talk about the best of the worst, San Francisco, California. Yeah, San Francisco, California. They lost 537,000 jobs. 56% have been recovered, but they're still 6.6% below pre-pandemic levels. So I'll ask that question again. Based on what I've told you so far, Would you be willing to put your hard-earned money into an investment in any of those towns? I think the answer is that you need to be informed. Yeah, what we're talking about right now is we're just talking about jobs, and we're talking about different metro markets that were struggling when it came to employment, but they're doing better now. Now, they've not pulled completely out of the ditch, so to speak. But they're on their way upward. Some of the things that come to my mind are the fact that we're dealing with New York City. Now, personally, I'm not interested in investing in New York City. I'm just not interested in investing there because I don't believe that New York City is very pro-landlord. And since I'm technically a landlord, it would make more sense to me to put my money in places where I think... I'm going to be protected if something goes terribly wrong. I look at the West Coast and I see Los Angeles. I see San Francisco. And the concern I have there is that's California. And again, California is not a very landlord favorable state. Vegas. Not to be outdone by Orlando, but those two towns right there, they're not in New York and they're not in California. Vegas, however, I think has potential. 
The only concern I have about Vegas is since I grew up there, I happen to know that the landscape, the political scape, if you would, in Las Vegas and Nevada as a whole is not necessarily pro landlord. I will tell you back in the day, I think that it might have been, but today I don't believe so. So as a result of that, I'm not so sure I'm too interested in that. But then I started looking at Orlando and I thought, you know, it's Florida. Florida tends to be pro landlord. Maybe I had to consider Florida. And when I start looking at Orlando, there, there's actually some other things going on in the economy of Orlando that is not all tourism based. Now, tourism, I mean, that's a big chunk of it, right? That's a lot of money coming in. But as we start to open up again, I start to think, well, if we're solving our employment issues, maybe Orlando could be a really great place to invest my money. So I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind. Now, having said that, there's a bunch of other cities, five to be exact, that have actually done extremely well. We'll talk about those when we come back. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. It's time to turn up the volume and fine-tune your passive income plan so you can create the lifestyle you've always wanted. Welcome back to the show. All right, let's get to the top five. Now, keep in mind, there are cities in between. And I'm not saying that any of these metro areas are better or worse than any others. All I'm doing today is is I'm just talking about the jobs market and how certain metroplexes have recovered better than other metroplexes. So let's get into those that, that actually did a better job recovering. Phoenix. Phoenix is doing exceptional. Now, they lost about 245,000 jobs, but not only have they recovered the 245,000 jobs, They've also added on an additional 14,000 jobs, which gets them out of the trench. Phoenix has fully recovered. The job market is very, very, very healthy in Phoenix. Something to think about. Oh, by the way, Phoenix is one of those areas when, you know, I'm thinking about investing my money. Phoenix is one of those areas where a lot of the green lights just keep going off for me. Now, on the East Coast, there's another market over there, kind of near Orlando, but it's not Orlando. It's actually on the West Coast of Florida called Tampa. You've heard of Tampa, right? Yeah, there's a guy named Tom Brady is playing football there or something, right? Yeah, you've heard of Tampa Bay, right? So Tampa is doing better than Phoenix. Now, Tampa only lost 172,000 jobs. I know it sounds like, oh, really, only 172,000? Okay, I'm not trying to make light of it. But they've come roaring back. Not only have they replaced all 172,000 jobs, they've added an additional 12,000 jobs on top of it. So the net is better than pre-pandemic levels. There's another city out there that's doing better than Tampa. Can you guess where it is? Well, this one, believe it or not, it's in Florida, too. Yeah, it's a, it's a town called Jacksonville. Have you heard of Jacksonville? Well, if you haven't, maybe you ought to put them on your, uh, your radar. Because this town lost 82,000 jobs during the pandemic, but now they have a net gain of 8,000 jobs above that. Yeah, they're, they're doing very well in Jacksonville, meaning... If you're looking for a place to invest your money, maybe Jacksonville might be a better opportunity for you than Orlando. But having said that, you still need to dig into these particular metroplexes. Just because I'm saying Jacksonville has better job growth or job recovery is what I should say than Orlando, you need to do your homework. Yeah, I'm just planting little seeds of ideas. 
you have to figure out what market makes total sense to you. Well, do you want a market that is doing much better than Jacksonville? Well, this particular market happens to be in Texas. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not Houston. It's not Dallas. It's not San Antonio. It's Austin. Yeah, Austin is roaring. Austin is roaring. They lost 142,000 jobs. They have a net gain of 24,000 jobs. They got them all back plus another 24,000. Austin is doing very well. Now, here's a warning about Austin. Austin is one of these little sub-markets that is like on fire when it comes to pricing. So be careful about Austin. It could be very easy to overpay in Austin. But if the metrics make sense and the fact that jobs are doing very well in Austin, Austin may be one of those towns that you need to put on your radar. But there is actually one particular town that has done better than the other 42. It's done better than Phoenix. It's done better than Jacksonville. It's done better than Tampa. It's done better than Austin. Salt Lake City. Yeah, Salt Lake City. Yeah, way up there, like 5,000 feet up in the uh, northern Utah mountains. They lost 110,000 jobs. They regained all 110,000 jobs. As a matter of fact, they added, now get this, 45,000 jobs in addition to the jobs that they recovered. Salt Lake City is doing great. Now, Salt Lake City might be one of those little towns that maybe you're interested in investing in, and maybe you're not. I don't know. You got to do your homework, right? But at the end of the day, Salt Lake City is outperforming every single municipality in this country. So what does it mean to you? Well, here's the big takeaway. All of these markets have either recovered or they are on their way to recovering. These markets have enjoyed growth. They're they're all coming back. Not one of these markets that I mentioned to you is losing jobs. Not not one of them. Now, they, they all lost jobs, but it wasn't their fault. These markets are all coming back. Now, think about it. Everything isn't perfect. Now, everything under the sun is not perfect. And we are still dealing with the labor shortage in this country. Yeah, turn on the news. They, they're talking about it all the time. We're still talking about supply chain problems. We're still talking about inflation. And, you know, the one thing they're not talking about right now, but if you look close enough in the news, they're, they're talking about it. Interest rates. So, where should you put your money? Well, I think you should put your money in the place where it gives you the best returns on investment. I think a lot of these markets are very, very favorable to commercial real estate investing. But I also, in the same breath, believe that you need to understand the political environment of the areas that you're thinking about investing in. And as a result of that, there, there are certain markets that I just will not invest in because I don't believe the political environment, let alone the laws that are on the books, are there to help me should I get myself into a, an, an issue with a resident. No, I just I won't invest there. There are other markets, however, that are favorable to landlords. And I, I prefer to put my money into those places. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, I never want to have an issue with, with a resident. I, I never want to get on the wrong side of anybody. As a matter of fact, I'm always upfront and I am honest with all of my residents. They know going in that if they're going to rent my property, got a couple of business rules. The first one is rent is due on the first. You got to pay it on the first. You can't pay it on the first. Waiting until the third to tell me that is not a good idea. Tell me up front you have an issue and I'll see if I can work with you. The second thing that you need to do when you rent my property is you need to take care of it. 
Now, if there's anything that goes wrong in the property, you need to let me know right away and we're going to get those things remedied. But if something happens in the property that, you know, is not like a bad toilet or something, you need to tell me about that. If somebody gets hurt on the property, you need to tell me about that. So I establish a good dialogue with my residents. And the beautiful thing is this, when I'm looking for the great residents that I enter into business relationships with, the one thing that always stands out, the one thing that always makes a huge difference for me is where the jobs market is at. If the economy is healthy, if people are working, things are going good. What you have to be concerned about is once, once you enter into that business relationship with that resident and they're paying you on time every month, they're enjoying your property. You also have to keep in the back of your mind what would happen to my resident if they lost their job. Now, in a healthy jobs market, that resident can go out and find a replacement job. And because the people that I'm renting to are not necessarily the, the most skilled people in a particular skill set, they potentially have flexibility. And as a result of that, throughout the pandemic, even though I had residents that were materially affected who lost their jobs during the pandemic, they were also ready, willing, and able to go out and find a replacement job, which they did. And as a result of finding that replacement job, they were able to keep paying their rent. This, my friends, is a beautiful thing. So, the jobs market, here's the big takeaway. The country is coming back. I understand that there are people that are refusing to work. And, and I understand why, because the government's still paying them money. I get that. But when that money finally runs out, those people are going to have to face reality, which is either go out and scrounge for your own food or get back into the workforce, start earning some money so that you can pay for the lifestyle that you're currently enjoying. Jobs are important. The health of the job market is very important. And the big takeaway today is that we are going in the right direction. If you want to take advantage of this, you want to figure out how to invest correctly in real estate, come join us. Go to lifestylesunlimitedworkshops.com. Get signed up. And let's get you started. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.